Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. And I'm Marissa Hansi. This is the show that talks about the tricks, the tools, the steps to the writing process, but also gives you the behind the scenes industry perspective, which is sometimes really hard to find and it can seem really intimidating. We're going to cover everything in between. And also, it's going to give you the information that you need to make the book world a lot less intimidating, hopefully. Um, remember that we are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, so make sure to click below to subscribe to be alerted ahead of every episode. So, right, what are we talking about today? Today, we're going to talk about creativity and the writing process during lockdown, which is something to all of us, um, although not so brand new anymore, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's really it's quite strange. Um, but also how things change for, you know, for writers, but also how the industry publishes a book during a time like this and how that is sort of forced to reinvent itself, um, you know, with, with no notice. <laughs> um, you know, how do you do a book tour? How do you, how do you market your book? You know, how do you, uh, you go on a morning television show, you know, if that was all, if that was all planned. Yeah. 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 And I, I think, you know, from my perspective, I think I, in the beginning, I kept hearing so many people saying, oh, Shakespeare wrote so many plays during, you know, and, you know, so many people wrote their magnum opus during exile. And I just think, well, realistically, okay, we put so much pressure on ourselves anyway, as, as writers that I think it's unfair to compare ourselves to all these literary geniuses because everybody has a different process. And also they probably weren't looking after children. I was there, I mean, that would be my first question. Yeah. If, you're, if you're in that, yeah. I mean, if you're a parent, that's also something that you have to figure out. But I think, you know, what's the headspace like, right? During lockdown, how does it change? Does your process get better, quicker? Or does it tend to slow down? What about if, if you have to meet a deadline? I think it's I think it's really tricky to navigate because also this is kind of new to everybody. And I think you know writing anyway is a solitary process, but then you have all of these other things to think about and process about what's going on in the world. And I think that's a kind of really interesting question to think about. Really, um, I'm quite fascinated by that. So yeah. I think you know. I've heard a few uh, a few things from friends, you know, in the industry that they're meeting people in parks, you know, sitting uh, sitting far away from them, and it's so different from what well, my experience, of course, working you know working in an office with, with authors every day was. So I, I just I, I genuinely can't imagine. Um, so normally we would talk a bit more about this from our perspectives uh, and then do our what makes this book great segment. But today, as we are lucky to, enough to have an author who is living and breathing this right now, we're going to go straight to her. It's great, and our guest um, has written several novels, one of them being about um, survivalist living. Uh, her characters go through that, and it's so relevant right now, but, um, you know, and I think we're kind of all living slightly survivalist creative lives. Um, so yeah, it's exciting. So on that note, let's bring out the wonderful Claire Fuller. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Oh, welcome to the show. We're so excited for you to have a chat with us. This is lovely. Thank you. So, Claire, I'm going to introduce you quickly. Quickly. Um, you. I don't do anything quickly. Uh, <laughs> so, you've had three novels published so far, right? Uh, beginning with Our Endless Numbered Days, which is just one of my favorite titles of a book I think I've ever heard. I just just love it. Um, it was published in the UK and throughout the world, right? And received many awards, including the American Booksellers Association's uh, Indies Best Book Awards and the Desmond Elliott Prize for Debut Fiction. So you also have potentially the most beautiful Instagram account of any author that I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm putting myself at serious risk saying that uh, with the amount of authors, you know, that, I, that I've worked with who are going to hear me say that now. So we'll start with Tatiana because she has some questions for you. So I'm curious, Claire, um, firstly, what are you working on now? Well, a couple of things. So my fourth novel, is Unsettled Ground, is out in January in the UK and in May in the US. So I'm just going through that whole 
process, the exciting bit really, the bit I like of copy edits, checking those, um, looking at covers, you know, all the bit that starts to make it feel like this is a book. Um, and the UK have already laid it out because they're a few months ahead, the publishing schedule is ahead. Um, so they've laid it out in um, proof pages, it's called. So it actually, although it's on A4 sheets, it looks like a book, you know, with all its titles and chapters and all that kind of stuff. So, so I'm doing that. And the uh, my American publishers have done their copy edits, and the UK publishers have done their copy edits. And obviously, they are completely different. <laughs> I have to decide which of the UK goes into the US and which of the US goes into the UK and, you know, different uses of words so that UK and US readers will get all that. And should a comma go here or should it go here? You know, um, nearly, nearly come to the end of that. Um, and then at the same time, in between things coming in, I'm, I'm writing um, book five, uh, wow. which... So I'm about, I think I've got about 25,000 words, something like that. And my books tend to be quite short. Mm -hmm. So I think they're normally about 80 or 90. So I am quite a way through, through. But the really tricky thing with this, and I haven't told either of you, is that I started this uh, the end of last year. And it is about a flu pandemic. Oh my God. <gasps> oh no. And then a flu pandemic actually happened. Well, or a pan maybe not flu, but a pandemic actually happened. Oh so, so in February, did you start wondering if you should be touching anything? Or if <laughs> you know, into existence? <laughs> and right at the beginning, when, you know, it was, wasn't clear how serious it was going to be, I was busily taking notes and listening to the radio and writing everything down. And then, it, it, you know, it, it felt wrong to do that after a while. Wow. <laughs> But um, it is a very different story. So it's just, it starts with that and, and then um, changes in a completely different way than the, what we've lived through. Mm -hmm. But that was, it has been a bit surreal. Yeah. That's, that's quite a project to take on, especially now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was so, I was such a long way through that I thought, you know, do I give this up? Do I start mm -hmm. something new? But this was the idea I'd had for a long time. Yeah, talk to my agent about it, and she said, "Well, just keep going. We'll see what happens." Mm -hmm. um, my publishers buy one book at a time, so they they don't know what it's about. They won't see it till it's finished, um, <laughs> and either they'll say yes or they'll say no. I, I, <laughs> I can't wait. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for their reaction when they're reading it, going, "Hang on a minute." <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, but yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the situation I'm in, so. You know, what you touched on just um, earlier when you were saying, like, I had the seed of an idea and I, I'm just kind of going for it, which was going to be my next question. What, in your books, and I'm not sure if that's changed with each, each book, but what is your aha moment? What, where, where does that seed come from? Um, with two of them, so with um, Swimming Lessons and Bitter Orange, so my second and my third, they both came from a piece of flash fiction that I had written. So I've got out of the habit of this, but I was writing a lot of really, really short flash fiction. So uh, stories that were only 100 words long. And so, for instance, with Bitter Orange, the story was about um, a man looking through a spy hole that he'd found in his bathroom floor into a flat below where there was a woman. Wow. And I thought, you know, what does he see? Because in a hundred words, I couldn't actually say what he saw or who he was or what he was doing or, you know, if she knew. And I, so I, I was intrigued. I wanted to write more. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I ended up writing 90,000 words more. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it actually turned into a, I thought it would be very interesting for a, for a woman to do the spying on a man. So I kind of reversed that. And the same kind of idea, a hundred word short story was with swimming lessons. But um, with our endless number of days, that was a news story. So it's about uh, a girl who's taken into the German forest by her father and they survive there for many years. And it was a, that, my aha moment for that really was um, 
reading a news story, I think it made the international papers about um, a young man who said he'd been living in the woods in Germany for the previous three or four years. His wow. father had died and he'd walked hundreds of miles to Berlin and he couldn't remember anything before that time. And I just thought that was so intriguing. Wow. Uh, but actually, it turned out that he'd made it all up and he had just run away from home. But for many months, wow. everybody believed him. Mm -hmm. um, so that was just, it was just calling out to be written, I think, that story. Yeah. Um, and with, with those books then, once you kind of have this idea, everybody has a different process. And I, you know, in this series, I always explore, I'm quite fascinated by each writer's individual process and how they work and how they set aside time and what kind of music they listen to. So has has your process from your debut book, has that changed over the years or do you like a very specific routine when the seed comes up? Um, it hasn't changed that dramatically. I've I've learned to trust it. I think that's that's what's changed. In the, the first one, I had no idea what I was doing and I was kind of writing blindly and thinking, I don't know what goes here. I don't know, you know, is this how a book, is this how you write a book? I don't really know. I'll just get to the end and see what happens. <laughs> and actually, all of them, I write like that still. So I still don't know what happens. I still am writing blindly, but I can trust that now because I know that you know for three three books four books I've managed to actually get to the end and yeah. then I go oh so that's what it was about yeah and then I edit um but it takes me about a year and a half to think that to work out what the book is about really. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because I think a lot of writers they see a finished product and they go oh well that seems kind of so easy to do I bet they wrote that in three months or whatever and I think you being so patient with how you develop an idea is such an important thing to hear because you know the there are so many there are wild assumptions about how people work and I think you know you trusting yourself is one of the most important thing things a writer can probably do is just be confident in how they work and not feel like there is a specific um, formula, you know? I think because you, know, you, see, you see so much advice on, you know, planning or pantsing as they are, you know, don't, don't plan, plan, do this, don't do this. And I think, you know, you kind of trusting how you work is really important, you know? Yeah, and what one one thing I've done from the very beginning that really helps with that is I keep a writing diary. So every day I write down uh, what my word length is and how that day went. So mm -hmm. things like I only wrote a hundred words, or yeah, this was a good day. I wrote three thousand, and then the day after I deleted those three thousand <laughs> words, or whatever it whatever it was. Um, and that means that with the subsequent book. I can go back and look at that, uh, the equivalent word count, and it's kind of reassuring because it just shows me that with every book, it's the, you know, at a certain point, I think, oh God, I just don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to give this up. And then I can keep going and get to the end and, and know that I can get to the end because I have proof, you know, I've written down that I had a bad day or a whole bad month, but, but I still do get to the end. So and that's really helpful. Does that ever does that ever change that feeling of okay, uh, this is insurmountable right now? What am I doing? Um, it changes, I think, when I'm approaching the end, <laughs> when I when the end is in sight, and although I don't plan, by the time I get to maybe three quarters of the way through that first draft, as I call it, although it's slightly edited as I go along. At the end is in sight and I know what's coming and it feels like, oh yes, I'm on the I'm on the homeward stretch now and and it's yeah. not so scary. Yeah. 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 Right, Marissa, I'm going to now give it up to you when it comes to the industry side. Okay. I feel like this is probably just because I've worked in publishing for so long, but I feel like now I'm getting the now we're gonna 
get to like the boring questions. <laughs> really, really interesting and fascinating. Um, but probably it's that's my uh, perspective because you know I've had to I've had to work on the practical side of things for so long that still the thrill of getting to talk to an author about how they create their work is you know yeah. still still really exciting. So, um, so you've as we uh, as we said had a few novels published now and I'm curious specifically about um, about the first one because it was met with such with such acclaim and obviously it was a Waterstones book club pick and it was it was a uh, Richard and Judy pick and everything and I, you know I, I know of course from being on the on the publishing side of that what a difference that can make within within the building and how people start to respond to your work. So I'm curious to know if your work with your publisher changed at all when that stuff started to happen, or you did you do you feel like you were sort of set up for that uh, that you know that path from the beginning? Um, there was a certain setup for for that mm -hmm. because you know we we're getting into the nitty gritty because of what they paid for it. Yeah. Um, because the more they pay for a book, the more money they put into marketing and, and promoting it. And I I might not have known that at the time, but I absolutely know that now. Um, and the book had gone to auction, so therefore they, you know, they, they hadn't paid kind of life-changing money. Sure. Um, but, but enough for them to think we need to put some money behind this. Yeah. Um, but it's still, you know, I, I'd like to think it won those prizes on its own merits. You know, you, uh, there's no way they can pay enough money to, you know, win, win, <laughs> make a book win prizes. I'll, but they I'll, can, I'll that. That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they can decide to put it forward for Richard and Judy Book yeah. Club or Waterstones Book Club, knowing that uh, if it gets selected, there will be some costs involved in that and so they they had decided to do that yeah. I guess with the book and with subsequent books they didn't always mm. do that at all and they've all done quite well but, yeah. but I guess didn't have the splash of the first one mm -hmm. that's um that, I think that's really important for people people to know to think a lot of um you know, you're you're absolutely right that you can't. You know, those those are certainly not paid placements or anything like that. But when a when a publisher does, you know, set you up in that way, and they know that your your work is that that kind of a book, you know, you're you're absolutely right that they are going to then they're going to back they're going to back it up with some money, which is you know, which is great, which is great for you. And one of the things that we have talked about in the past for you know, kind of bringing people into reality is that that doesn't that doesn't always happen. Yeah, it doesn't usually happen, uh, you yes. know. I, it hasn't happened with the subsequent books, so <laughs> yeah. It's I know it's uh it's something that is you know it's, it's quite common. Um, so I'm curious about what you have done um on your own, right? Of your you know uh you know off your own back to supplement the work that your publisher does, right? To market and to promote the book. Um, and maybe anything that you found particularly beneficial. I do do a huge amount, mm -hmm. I think, com compared to some other authors that I know. But I do it. I do it very willingly, kind of understanding that this is my career, yeah. and yeah. also, you know, the thing I learned from having been traditionally published is that you get about, well, unless you're stratospheric and I don't know, Margaret Atwood, um, you get about six weeks of a publicist. Um, and that is some time beforehand, and then the book's published and a little bit of time afterwards. Mm -hmm. And they will, the publicists um, in my publishers will have worked really hard on my behalf and on the book's behalf. Yeah. But I know that that is finite. They have to move on to the next book they're publishing. Um, so I, yeah, I do lots of things. I, you know, reach out to people. I kind of more or less say yes to nearly everything. Um, and and very willingly, um, because what I found is that you do something that might be quite small. So, for instance, I went to visit um, a book club that had read, I think, I think it was our endless number of days, who were at my husband's work. Mm -hmm. And I was willing to go up there, you know, about 10 people and sit around and talk about the book with them and very happy to. And then um, about a week ago, so many years after this book club, I've been invited to a um, literature event uh, festival 
who by someone who is the sister of someone who is in that book club. So uh, that how it seems to work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all those little connections and and being willing to do things. But then I also, as she said, do Instagram yeah. and Twitter to a certain extent and Facebook perhaps not so much. Mm -hmm. But I have a website. I sent out a newsletter every so often um, and try to do just little bits of promotion. Yeah, and here it, and there. It's all consuming, isn't it? And I think some people really do enjoy it. Like you were saying previously at the beginning of the, uh, of the show, you said that you enjoy the minutia of getting involved in kind of even editing and stuff like that. So I think this is really interesting because there are so many writers out there and authors who just don't understand how to market themselves almost. And I know that sounds really boring, but that's exactly what you're doing. And I think it's, it's amazing when somebody then, if you have somebody, if you have a publicist for six weeks or so, that's almost like training, I imagine, you know, that kind of, that you're almost kind of taking bits and pieces of what you can then carry on to make it more sustainable. To a certain extent, but the thing that the publicist does that I can't do is get the reviews in the national papers and magazines because those um, reviewers aren't really set up or interested or whatever reason, aren't don't really talk to authors. They want to have that publicist in between. So so that's both in America and in the UK, that's what they, they tend to do. Although they will also put me forward to for events and literature festivals and things like that and fix those up. Um, hmm. And also if I have a little mini book tour, they'll help with that. Sometimes a, a, the assistant editor will come along with me. Um, so I get a feel for what I should be doing. But then after their six weeks or whatever it is, is up, um, what I do is slightly different because I can't have those connections with journalists particularly. Yeah. Right. You, you touched on a few, um, a few points there that I think are, are really worth driving home, which is that publicity is one of the most difficult things, I think, to replicate on your own. You know, versus having a traditional a traditional publisher behind you and the team, you know, the team in publicity, because absolutely they are the people who maintain those contacts. They talk to people all the time. They have the relationships, you know, in a in a very similar way that agents work with their kind of encyclopedic knowledge of publishers and editors. You know, your publicist at a at a publisher is is your connection to to journalists, and that's you know, and that's pretty huge. And and as you said something that's nearly nearly impossible to replicate on your own um, but the other two things was you know one treating this as your career really I think a lot of authors um, and I've certainly experienced this many authors will once they see their marketing plans or their you know they they've gotten a publisher and they get so far along in the process kind of think okay it's your job now you know and, and, and I'm going to be successful because I have a publisher and I have all these people who are working for me and it's very important to remember, the budgets and what it comes down to and how many how much time you really you really do get from your publisher because of how many books especially the big publishers are, are, are you know are printing and publishing every week um but the marketing plans as well i think your the work that you are doing is you know is often that's the work that that people are doing in the public in you know in the publishing houses a lot of times especially when there are budget restrictions you're coming down to really grassroots you know stuff where you're sitting and you are you are going to meet with book clubs and you know it's a lot of hoofing it and a lot, you know around the country really which is you know easier and slightly easier in the uk <laughs> yeah. um, but it's it's absolutely it's so important that you you know that you're doing those kinds of things whether you are someone who is self-published or you are traditionally published, you know, taking it seriously and continuing to do those things on your own will absolutely contribute to the you know, continued success of your book. And I think you're, you're absolutely testament to that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is really important, but, but I, I understand that it doesn't come naturally to, to some people. Yeah. Um, I worked in marketing for many years before I, stopped and and started writing full-time but it was, it was very different marketing it was 
business to business and it was technology that was nothing to do with books or writing but the same principles apply you know you've got to work out what your audience wants to hear and you've got to kind of tell it to them really that you know that's the principle yeah absolutely so how have you adapted to promoting uh, your work during this time that we are all pulling up in our homes. Have you done anything particularly clever that you really enjoyed? Oh, I'd love to say that I have. But I, yeah, I'm not sure I've done anything particularly clever. Um, <laughs> what has happened is that I had, <laughs> I had um, quite a few events booked. Mm -hmm. You know, festivals booked, and they, in fact, I, I think all but one of them were were cancelled completely. They didn't even go online. Um, so, you know, it's not possible to just pick those up. I have sent off a few emails to other things that I know are online and said, you know, I'm here, would you like to? But it is also, I have to gear myself up for that yeah. because it's fine to have an invitation and to accept it, mm -hmm. but to push yourself forward is a whole different thing and and much more scary and, and scary even for me who, you know, don't, generally doesn't mind this kind of stuff yeah. um so it's been hard but i i also run in my hometown i run uh, a kind of open book club where we all read a book and people can come along and then we interview an author and this normally without lockdown takes place in um a lovely little cocktail bar down the road so that's been shut so they were probably going to you know not do it at all and I said well let's go on to zoom and I've been doing the interviews so in that way I suppose um I've been doing you know tiny tiny bits of yeah. promotion but it also feels slightly wrong to be going you know buy my books buy my books I'm here when you know people are dying and people are ill and uh, and even the idea of writing books I've had to grapple with, you know, when my best friend is an A and E nurse, and you know there are doctors, oh, no. you know, all that kind of stuff going on. It's it, it. So for a little while, it certainly felt. Oh, I'm not sure I should be doing this at all. Yeah, I mean, I think. Do you find that it's <clears throat> especially now with everything else that's going on? Do you find that it's been more difficult to be creative because you are like I think you know Marissa and I were saying in the beginning it's it must be really strange to have to grapple with everything else that's happening plus you you want to be selfish with your work right now and just try to is do you feel like that's a battle or do you feel you can compartmentalize and kind of you know um separate the two it's it's become much easier when this when it all started and in the UK lockdown for us started uh, I think it was the 23rd of March then it was impossible to do any work or even read fiction I was just kind of scrolling and uh, refreshing the news and just almost kind of feeling in shock yeah. I, I think like the rest of the world I'm sure um, but that has gradually eased and and I have got back into writing, although it's, you know, it's, it's still changed for me because my husband is now working from home. My son uh, has come back home, 25, you know, looking for a job. And so the house, which used to be very quiet and my own for a certain amount of time, <laughs> is no longer like that, um, which is lovely, but also, sure. you know, it interrupts Disrupt the process. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I wanted to um, ask you uh, what, and this is something that we are asking all of our guests, and I think it's something kind of interesting to um, explore. If you could do anything else apart from being an author um, and doing what you love right now, if you could love a different profession, what would it be? I think... Uh, I think it might be being a midwife. Oh. Is, it, is, it, is it the same job title in the US, midwife? Yes, we yeah. do have midwives, although in the US, there's, they are seen in a very 
different light than say traditional doctors, which is a shame because I lived in the UK for 12 years and midwives to me are absolute heroes. Mm -hmm. and that, that to me is how you deliver a baby. But as in the US, they're kind of, it's not as common to use a midwife. You'll have a nurse, a nurse uh, with you. Okay. Yeah. Similar things um, and it will mostly be the same as in you wouldn't see a doctor unless something was wrong, yeah. but but yeah. they are very different and they, they approach it very differently from midwives. Yeah. So what yeah, why, that will not be the case for me this time. <laughs> so why why midwifery? What a what a lovely profession. Yeah, well, kind of scary. I like the idea that you know there is some kind of uh, perhaps I shouldn't be saying this considering, but um jeopardy, there is some kind of jeopardy, isn't there? You know, that Things have the potential to go wrong. Let's hope they they don't, and and everything is fine. But you know that that kind of, I wouldn't want a job that was just you know very very easy, and he never even kind of considered it. Um, but also, or, you know, not just that, but the stories of the people who come in, and you you're seeing this relationship often, you know, if, if um, two partners come in mm -hmm. and the baby arrives and then often, you know, there might be uh, other relatives around and just that dynamic, I think, I guess then actually I would still be a writer because I would be kind of uh, trying to work out, how, you know, all the little stories. <laughs> um, but I, but I, I think that would be fascinating. Yeah, I think, I think it would you know, it's interesting about what you said, because that's exactly what I was thinking in my head. It's the stories and the way you write, actually, you there's an intimacy in the voice in throughout all of your books. And I think that it it almost it almost makes sense that you would pick something like that, because all of those connections that are happening and kind of new life starting to bubble. I think you I, I, I completely understand why you would pick that. That's interesting. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I love that. I love that answer. Yeah. Um, so, is there anything you could share about yourself or your writing uh, that people might be surprised to know about you? Oh, um, God, what, what? Yeah, what kind of things do you mean? Uh, you put me on the spot. Oh God. Um, I don't think anything. A hobby. Something about your daily life, so something about what you do to set up your writing day? Well, before I was a writer and before I worked in marketing, I was a sculptor. So my first degree was in sculpture, um, in wood and stone carving. So I used to have you know, massive big pieces of limestone that I would carve by hand. Wow. Um, and having started writing, the kind of... Uh, the, the the creative outlet feels satisfied with creating the words. Mm -hmm. So I've got, you know, bits of wood and bits of stone lying around my garden that I haven't touched for quite a few years now. And often it does make me feel guilty. <laughs> um, <laughs> but people sometimes also ask me about the process between creating art and creating novels and I've obviously said oh no they're completely separate but I what's quite interesting is I think my process is quite similar so I would start with a piece of stone without really knowing what it was going to be what I was going to carve and I would start carving and if I liked that I would do it some more if it didn't work I would kind of you know change it do something different until the final piece almost emerged and i i think i think i kind of write the same way weirdly um yeah so there oh. you go <laughs> that was, that was funny by the way because i think if you ask me you know what uh, what is something that you know people don't know about you is you know the most interesting thing i could say right now is well i put butter on one side of my bagel and cream cheese on the other you know <laughs> red sculptor and you're <laughs> <laughs> very impressive <laughs> well I'm going to come up with something like um, what I have for breakfast every morning is toast with butter, lots and lots of salted butter and marmite mm -hmm. 
I'm not sure that's the thing over there, but anyway, I love Marmite. Oh, I love it yeah. so much that by the time I've eaten my toast and with my butter and my Marmite, I will then, without making sure that no one's looking, dip my knife in the butter and in the Marmite and just look it off. <laughs> <laughs> my, because, because I'm Ukrainian, I grew up uh, conditioned to um, the way we eat butter is that you have to see teeth marks in when you put butter on toast, you oh, should yeah. see that's, that's the, the right amount of butter, yes. That's my kind of butter, yeah, yeah definitely. I could do away without with, with the toast. Just yeah. give yeah. the butter and the marmite. Yeah. I think I think in the US there's something like a butter of the month club. I think there, which would be oh, yeah. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. I'm gonna so, go. My last question for you, um, Claire, is going to be a very, very difficult one. So brace yourself. Okay. <laughs> Desert Island book. Um, yeah, but do you mean one that, uh, one that I love? Are you really asking a book that I love or a book that would actually be good for Desert Island? Because if it was good for Desert Island, I might take a DIY book or something. Yes. Which is not very romantic, is it? <laughs> You're the first person that's actually analyzed that question. <laughs> that was the first but, but you're right. So it, it should be something that you can dip into, almost like cherish like a piece of chocolate over and over again, like something that gets back to you. Uh, and I'm only allowed one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I might. I think I might go for. I don't know what book it would be exactly, but some John Donne poetry. Oh, um, yeah. Because I learned a couple at school, you know, many years ago, and I still remember loving it. Uh, but I don't have any. I don't. And, and it would be lovely to be able to memorize them. I think, um, and to be able to say them when I'm rescued, I yeah. could just spout John Dunn at people. <laughs> I am not ill. I have. I'm fine. I just want you to know these verses. <laughs> I love that. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, is there anything that you want to leave people with about how to find you online, website, Twitter, Instagram? Uh, Instagram is, uh, what is it? Writer Claire Fuller. Mm -hmm. And Twitter, really silly, is Claire Fuller 2, the number 2. Um, so, yeah, find me there. Our website, I guess, is www.clairefuller.co.uk. It's my bit of marketing. Yeah. <laughs> people the opportunity to say those things. It's just yeah. Oh, Claire, honestly, it's what, what a gift. Thank you so much for chatting with us, honestly. It's just, it's breathed so much life into the person behind the words, and it's been lovely. Oh, it's been lovely to meet you, too. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. That was so great. Oh my goodness. I loved it so much. And um, I mean, what else can we say? I mean, I think the creativity process during lockdown has been, you know, great to be explored. I think at any point, we're going to always feel slightly isolated, you know, with how we write and how we do things. And I think just unveiling that process is so, um, has been so brilliant. Um, so I think yeah. things feeling trivialized right now, everything, your life's work feeling trivialized right now is, <laughs> you know, a uh, thing to really, to really think about. Cause I think we're all experiencing that in some ways and it's good to talk about. It is. So thank you everyone for joining us today on the craft and business of books. Remember we are on every Friday. So please click the link below to subscribe. See you next week. Bye.